So perhaps, Simon, you could tell us how you got into the music biz and what, what led you there. I gather you, you played keyboards in a, in a band, first of all. That's one of your early, um, according to your biography. Yes, and, and uh, various things. Hmm. Um, so I did you come from a very... musical family? Did they? Was no, there... no, no, not at all. No, actually, I, I started out um, doing art and design, really. That was my main thing, and, right. uh, and theatre. And I, so when I came down to London, I was doing a theatre design. Where, where were you from originally? Um, we moved around all the time. Right. I was originally from Sheffield, all right. and I'd spent my early years there. Hmm. But we we moved every four or five years, so it was it, you know I never really had a have a sort of settled place. Oh, yeah. But we lived in the Midlands uh, when I was a teenager, and then uh, I moved down to London to go to college. Right, and I did theatre design. But I guess like a lot of like in the tradition of a lot of people who go to art school in London ended up spending more time <laughs> listening to music and going yes. to gigs and right. getting involved with bands than, than actually doing the yeah. college work. Yeah. And so, uh, although I, ca I worked in theatre for, for a couple of years afterwards, um, I, I was in a couple of bands and we were experimenting with uh, very early, you know, like drum machines and mm. arpeggiators on mono synths yeah. and things like that and uh, putting in some pretty terrible performances. <laughs> And I sang in some of those bands, and I played a bit of guitar. And I, I was never really—I I never had a formal music education. No. And it was just one of those things where I was actually probably more interested in the technology of what these things could right. do. But it takes some dedication to pick up a guitar and work out how to play it. Well, yeah, but you know, as long as there there are three or four basic chord shapes, aren't there? And you can kind of get away with it, really, <laughs> as long as you've got enough effects on there. Mm. And that's kind of what I was doing, really. And um. And then uh, I, I decided to, uh, I got a job with this uh, hire company, Audio Rents, yeah, that I mentioned right. to you. And, uh, How did that come about then? Because that's not a, um, no, a, I think, a very I think big it was, Well, I think it was one of those things where it was, um, I was looking for work with, in fringe theatre and somebody knew somebody who yeah. did this and they said, oh, well, they're looking for a driver and it's just a day, you know, it's a day job. Yeah. Or so I originally thought when I first took it on, I didn't realise there'd be, uh, you know, making deliveries of lexicons to studios in the middle of the night and stuff like that involved. <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like if somebody would suddenly decide in the three o'clock in the morning, what we need yeah. is another lexicon. <laughs> Let's phone that guy. And um, But that's what used to happen. So I did that for a couple of years. And... Um, during that period, I carried on doing band stuff, and uh, I, I did a little stint with uh, playing keyboards with Dead or Alive, mm. which was great fun because I was that after they were Dead famous, or was that? It's sort of a, yeah, within the two or three years after. It wasn't when they were at their peak here, mm. although they they'd they'd got really really big in Japan. Right, um, the usual thing, I suppose, for a lot of bands, they got sort of. Big there, and was that something on. somebody you met through the renting, but turning up at studios, or was that yeah, right. it's, yes, and and um, and also I, I'd got into doing um, digital editing when I first started at Mayfair, right? Um, using the old sixteen thirty editors and mm. stuff like that, and I'd kind of was one of the people there who who um, seemed to get on with the system because yeah. it wasn't easy to use and it was a bit clunky. Mm. But I, I put uh, I put a, a, a sort of remix album with Dead or Alive together on one of those systems, and they were, you know, piles of pneumatic tapes everywhere, and we basically <laughs> spent a, a sort of forty-eight hour stretch just putting this album together from right. loads and loads. So this loads was after you'd been their keyboard player when you. Uh, no, that, that was that was when I met them, and then oh, they uh, they asked me if I would if, if I'd like to come. Oh, right. And, uh, so you were already at Mayfair before that, then, were you? Or? Yes, I just right. I'd, I just started really. I see. And, uh, so that so your Mayfair job presumably came from turning up delivering lexicons in the middle. Yeah, of the I mean, when I was when I was with Audio Rents, of course, I was just going round. What was great about mm. it was that I got to know where all the studios yeah. in London were, yeah. and in surrounding area, and and got to know people at all of the places, mm. and. and uh, Audio Rent's office was in Primrose Hill and just oh, right. pretty much yeah. around the corner from Mayfair. So they were very regular clients because they knew we could get there in five minutes. Mm. And um, and also uh, all the assistants there and stuff became friends and we, mm. and you know, drinking buddies and stuff because mm. 
there were a couple of good pubs around the corner. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I made particular friends with uh, a guy there, Noel Rafferty. I don't know yeah, if you yeah. know him. Mm. And he was assisting and doing little bits of engineering at the time. And we would we we were doing a little bit of songwriting and stuff as well. And then uh, suddenly somebody, uh, one of their quite more experienced assistants left and they needed someone quick because mm. it was a very busy studio at yeah, the time. Yeah. And, um, so they wanted somebody who could come in and, and start assisting fairly quickly. Mm. And because I'd been getting to know all the uh, like uh, outboard equipment and microphones and things like that, I got a bit of a head start. Yeah, on that. yeah. So I, I went in and just, I, I did a bit of the usual running type duties and stuff right. for, for but not for very long they wanted to get me into the studio mm. pretty quick mm. so it was kind of, I was kind of fast tracked which was good mm. and um yeah and it, and it so went from there and that's when I, I did the dead or alive thing and went yeah. I did a, a tour in Japan with them which was great fun and it was you know who would say no if there's something would you like to come to Japan for three weeks and <laughs> ask about uh, play some very simple keyboard lines so yeah fine in front of Tens of thousands of people. No. Great fun. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> and so did you have to give up your job at Mayfair? Or no, no. They they very kindly gave me um, like four weeks off. Wow. And um, off I went and did that, and then Brilliant. came back again and yeah. was making tea for John Hudson again. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, he was a good source of information, though. Yes, of course. Was, uh, I mean. He was a hard taskmaster. I would, mm. you know, I think most people who work with him would probably say that. He, mm. but in a good way. Yeah. You know, he would make sure that you knew if he was, if you were doing something that he didn't think was right, or if you were talking when you shouldn't be, or mm. he, you know, very simple things sometimes. But I mean, learning how to be an assistant, especially in those days when I think that their, you know, studios were run on a kind of quite strict professional yeah, basis yeah. Uh, they were more expensive than they are these days it's mm. a bit more formal probably as well um, there was a whole etiquette to learn mm. about being in the studio mm. and I think it's a positive thing it was a good thing to learn I, mm. and it's a sort of I think it's a little bit of a shame that a lot of people going up through this although there's obviously a lot less places now mm. for people to learn that way um, it's a kind of shame that they that they're not learning that aspect of it. Yeah, because I think it's it it stands you in good stead for later on. Mm. There's a certain discipline about it that's that's very useful mm. and practical. Yeah, apart from anything else. Yeah. But yeah, so he was he was you know he was quite full on with that aspect of things, mm. and also his his philosophy about being in the studio with an assistant was that the assistant should be the person on the session who really knows more than anybody else about what's going on yeah and it's, it kind of makes sense when yeah. you think about yeah. it they're the person who should know what's on what piece of tape yeah <clears throat> they should know what bit of equipment was doing mm -hmm. connected to what when you were recording something so basically just to make the session run mm. as efficiently as possible yeah and uh, even down to knowing what kind of sandwich yes the, the drummer likes you know, <laughs> silly things like that. But if if all of those kind of things are organised and taken care of, and then the, the this, it makes sense that the session can progress smoothly and Absolutely. everyone's happy, and it yeah. kind of makes for a good environment. <laughs> but, but I mean, I, I I assisted people like Bob Clear Mountain, yeah. Michael Brower, um, just anyone who was coming through really that mm. Mayfair was one of the places to work yeah and, um, so you, you know did you ever become in-house engineer as such or? well yeah I, I, I did I did get to that level mm. um, sort of for the last year or two I started mm. engineering you know the usual pro process I suppose you end up maybe yeah. uh, mixing the occasional b-side right um, doing recording sessions quite a lot on your own obviously yeah that, that was more often mm. than not the case you know being the person who was do recording the vocals and stuff because <laughs> nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, all great experience. And, well, yeah. and and I started doing more and more mixing. Also, um, one aspect of it that was really good for me was that uh, because I'd got this background working in doing stuff with bands who were using electronics and stuff, I'd got into programming yeah. very early. 
and I'd bought myself an Atari and a, a sampler and stuff like that before I even started at Mayfair. Right. And then I, when I was there, I upgraded my stuff. I got one of the first S thousands. Right. And I was using uh, C Lab stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the only people in the, the studio who really knew how to do all that kind yeah. of stuff. So when there were a lot more s sessions like that happening, and so I got quite a lot of. Um, people wanting me to work on their sessions because I could do that that aspect of things mm. and that's how I got to work with people like Soul to Soul who, mm. were, who were doing lots of remixes, they were using drum loops and right. there was a lot more programming mm. involved mm. and somebody who knew how to hook an Atari up to a tape machine and make it all work yeah. was, you know, they were they were they were into that. Yeah, I, mean, I remember somebody saying some years ago, synchronisation is how studios make money because it's the, the time you spend trying to make the the forty eight track lock up or the MIDI lock exactly, up to the yeah. SRC to the you know and that was one thing that they were really on the on the case with at Mayfair yeah. at the time. Uh, uh, John was uh, had come from a background at the BBC and he was very technical. He he could have been uh, the, a maintenance guy in any studio. Mm, really, mm. he was that knowledgeable about yeah. the technical side of stuff much more so than I've ever been. Mm. Um, and I learned an awful lot from him about uh, you know things like word clock and, mm. and, and video references and, and time code and just ha how all those things work together. And, yeah. Um, but he was doing that very early at Mayfair. There were still a lot of places at that time, we're talking sort of mid to late 80s, mm. that didn't know anything about yeah. that kind of stuff. I remember watching all those chaotic sessions where yeah. <laughs> things and, didn't but, quite work. And we were doing a lot of sessions where we were locking up video, uh, a variety of different kinds of tape machines, and uh, early sequences and stuff like that, and getting it all to work. Yeah, and that was that. So it, they were complicated things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I did one thing when I was working on one of the Tears for Fears albums. I was, and and we had so much equipment going. And the, was that with Dave Bascom? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we that was in the the big studio at Mayfair, the seventy two channel mm. SSL and they and we had to hire in another desk <laughs> because there weren't enough channels on the on it the was SSL. Him, it was him who'd ring up for the extra lexicon at three o'clock in the morning, wasn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> it was actually mainly one of the guys down at the Fallout shelter, you know, in uh, Ireland's right. studio right. there, uh, Groucho. Yes. He was he was he him, was yeah. the one who would uh, who would call up at three o'clock on a sat uh, like a Sunday morning or yeah. something like that, and he was still halfway through a mix. <laughs> Just yeah, I, m I remember assisting him on a session at Livingston. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're all great guys, but I mean that that whole thing of you know working round the clock and stuff was, uh, I mean, a lot of it based on the fact that the studios were costing yeah a grand plus a day mm. and. And they were, you know, they were hiring several hundred pounds worth of equipment or mm. per day and stuff like that. And there was big money, but big, yeah. so big pressure. And so, how did you escape from Mayfair? Um, well, I I had been working quite a bit at Mayfair with uh, Stephen Haig mm. uh, on things like New Order. I did a Susie and the Banshees album mm. with him, and. He had basically said he that if I decided to le go freelance, then he would he would um, get me work um, right. as a uh, on the recording side. Mm. I mean, not he had a had a mix engineer at the sure. time. Sure, yeah. Um, and I kind of thought I'd, I'd had I'd recently had a fairly big hit with the farm. Um, mm. One of the first things that I'd mixed was uh, All Together Now by mm. the Farm, and that was was and Huge record, thought, oh, yeah. this, this mixing luck's not <laughs> so bad, you know. <coughs> Have a, a big hit, yeah. and it was you know fortuitous that I got to do it, as it was one of those situations where the engineer, I think it was Kevin Petrie, um, was ill, yeah. and couldn't do the weekend. They wanted to mix it over the weekend, mm. and he wasn't free. I was assisting, and so I just ended up doing it. And mm. uh, and uh, it was another thing where we were running live stuff off an Atari yeah. and samplers yeah. and things like that. So uh, they they you know I could handle all of that. We were doing it in Mayfair Muse, which was the small, it was mm. like a thirty-two channel SSL. So it was all it was it was you know not an easy thing to have done. But, and and we were doing overdubs as well all the way through the mixing process. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was a pretty full-on session, and uh, but so yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd had a couple of hit singles, and 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 I thought, well, okay, and I've got a promise from a producer to 
mm. provide work. So I thought, well, this is a, this is probably a good time to branch out. Yeah. You know, and Mayfair at that time were looking to expand. They had taken over Utopia, right? And they were looking to. But then, of course, all of a sudden, this a bit like what's happened recently. There was a bit a big recession suddenly happened. Mm. Mayfair suffered. They they it looked like things were going a bit pear shaped there, and right enough, not a few months after I left, they they had to close down for a while mm. and stop the utopia thing. So I kind of think I picked a pretty good time to 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 jump ship. Really, I didn't, mm. uh, and, and and I felt that four years worth of in house experience was kind of about right. Yeah. Um, although, of course. Once I started freelancing, immediately I realised that I didn't know anywhere near as much as I thought I did. Of course, because as soon as you go into a different studio, yeah. it's like everything's in a different place. It's yeah. like, oh, right. And then you have to deal with learning different desks yeah. and on all of that kind of thing. Um, but I got great opportunities to do that. And I, I, I freelanced with Stephen Haig for the first couple of years. Um, that was when I, I recorded... A new order album mm. at Real World, so that was a great first yeah. experience yeah. to. And uh, it was quite a long album, so I got the chance to sort of settle into being freelance mm. and stuff like that. And and uh, then New Order asked me if I'd go on tour with them doing yeah. their programming, so I did that for the best part of a year. And then when I came back to freelancing again, I'd, Stephen was still doing stuff, so I did a couple of albums, more albums with him. Mm. Uh, then I got a, a man got a manager. I got uh, Zeta from Z yeah. Management uh, yeah. took me on very kindly, as I can see now, looking back on it, I was very <laughs> relatively inexperienced. But she she got me some good contacts, mm. and, and um, also some of my Mayfair things. The soul to soul connection mm. was uh, with uh, I, I got to know Nelly Hooper yes. quite well, and particularly Howie B, mm. who was engineering all that mm. stuff. I did a lot of remix work with him when I was still at Mayfair. And uh, and also the Boiler House guys, oh, yeah, yeah, Ben yeah. and Andy, mm. uh, were friends with all of them. Mm -hmm. And, and I, Ben and Andy were producing a lot of stuff by the time I um, things were wrapping up with Stephen Haig. So mm. I, I moved on to doing lots of stuff with Boiler House and with other uh, Zed management people like mm. Sly and Robbie. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, throughout the sort of mid mid to late part of the nineties, I was doing all of that kind of mm. stuff and working with people like Texas, mm. and, uh, you know, a combination of mixing and programming, yeah, mostly. And, and you, then, uh, presumably, you've also you found that having management helps make contacts with other teams that you collaborate with as well. Absolutely, and you know, just just generally sort of st staying in touch with everybody. It's a, it. Uh, I think having a manager is. If you're somebody who, like I am, who's uh, I'm not particularly, you know, in the in the music thing for the whole socialising aspect mm. of it, um, and generally speaking, been lucky enough to be busy enough to be in the studio most of the time, yeah. then the, you don't really get to do all of that. You don't yeah. really get the time to go and mm. do all of the networking and and making new contacts mm. and making new friends and stuff. You you kind of meet people through the sessions you're mm. doing, but that's sort of the limit of it so to have somebody out there mm. who's doing all of those things that you'd kind of like to have the time to do yeah is um really positive now, presumably these days a lot of people must find you via the internet and approach you directly yeah there's you know it's that's one aspect of it where it's really changed is that mm. i can you know i can be in here and i'll get something popping up on facebook or on email or whatever yeah of somebody who wants to make contact with a view to Hmm. Doing some work. Do you then give them your manager's phone number? <laughs> Depends who they are. <laughs> Depends who they are. You know, if it's it, if it's a friend of a friend and 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 it's somebody you already know something about, then and and you and it's something positive, then you know the easiest thing is just to carry on making yeah. direct contact with people yeah. because uh, you know that that's that's the easiest way to do it rather yeah. than having your manager talk to their manager and stuff as yeah. you know I'm sure yeah. that, that a lot of it can get kind of misinterpreted or yeah. diluted and they, that. And they take a big chunk of the well, it's well. A, I mean my, my, my situation is <laughs> I, I was with said management for about I guess about four to five years or right, so right. Um, and that kind of came to a natural end mm. they, I, I was I was sort of keen on doing other things yeah. than the sort of stuff they were getting Yes, and and it coincided with me getting back together with Nellie Hooper right. and working 
a lot with him. Yes. And that was direct through the contact I'd had from years ago. So mm -hmm. I didn't. It wasn't. Didn't need to go through management. No. And uh, and he was. You know, he he was a very busy producer at that time, and and uh, we could pretty much be working with him almost exclusively. I'd still go and do occasional other bits and bobs, yeah. but, but for quite a chunk there, about five years or so, I was, mm. I was pretty much just working with him. Right. Um, which was great, because that's when I got to do all of these great things like No Doubt and Gwen Stefani and U2 and mm. Lamb and um, really good quality, high level stuff, which has been great for me. Yeah. And uh, and then, I, but after I'd been doing that for a few years, then uh, Nelly was sort of branching out he was going he was spending more time in America and things right. like that so I I I found another manager in uh, Stephen Budd mm. and uh I, I have a kind of a, a great arrangement they they're really good because it's 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 not terribly it's not totally formal it's all mm. you know they they bring in what they bring in you know I do through them and what I bring in from having all of these old contacts and people I've worked with for years and stuff, then I'd handle that myself. So it's it's a good Perfect. it's a yeah. good arrangement. Yeah. So let's get a bit more technical then. Tell us about um, you just that mixed the Underworld album. Yes. Um so um how involved with the band when you were mixing? How much of it did you change or did you trigger any samples? What how did, what was the process? How did it work? Um it was very unusual. I mean, I mean, you know, the standard process is people will either, you know, they'll send you their files mm. for a song or they'll bring them to you and they'll either they'll be here or not and you one song at a time you'll get it up on the desk and you'll mix them. Yeah. <coughs> uh it was very different with Underworld. I mean, I've known Rick for a while as a he he lives close to to me here mm. and uh he's got his own studio. So I we started off by going into his place. Right. Um, where he's got a Logic set up mm -hmm. and I would just start off with his Logic sequences and do a little bit of tweaking on them mm. he'd basically say well <coughs> have a listen to this track and just do something with it that you would do you know, do a little bit of mixing on it and, yeah. and we were doing that on all the tracks yeah. at the same time and they were all in different stages of development as well because yeah. uh, Underworld's collaborated on them with various different dance producers mm -hmm. so we'd be getting files coming in from from one from high contrast or something and then another coming in from dub file wh whoever it was yeah I thought it was a collaboration with Paul Van Dyke on yeah on, that, on, that was on one track and yeah. uh, uh, D Ramirez and Mark Knight on a couple of the mm. tracks and stuff uh, and so we, we'd got lots of different things coming in from all over the place so yeah. everything was all in logic mm -hmm. but there was a lot of some some tracks would involve stuff being sent as audio bounces. Some would be sequences, and some, mm. as you can imagine, there was yeah. probably there, there was quite a lot of jigger, jiggery pokery going on with everybody having the same software and yeah. stuff like that. So there was a lot of programming involved in the mixing. Mm. And uh, once we'd got everything kind of collated and everything up to a point where we were sort of happy with it over at his place, mm -hmm. then we kind of decamped over to here and got an identical rig right. set up in here. Uh, and what they they used Logic with a, a with RME interfaces, mm -hmm. and we had all of that set up in here and and plumbed them into the SSL. Oh right, right. And then, you know. Did our sort of fine tweaking and our, mm. our sort of uh, fine tuning and, and 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 getting the sound of the desk and mm -hmm. the, and the bus compressor right. and all of that um, added into the into yep. the e equation. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where all of the tracks were sort of developing. Yeah. Slowly, one. Were you using know. any analog outboard or um, a, t a little, a little? But what we tend to do is is record it back in. Yeah. Um, I li like my. Ricasti, for example, mm. which we'll talk about more later, is sort of my favourite reverb. Right. But I managed to get hold of a set of impulse responses for the Ricasti. Yes, so we, I got those, yeah. yeah. So um, we, I was using those a lot within Space Designer yeah. in Logic. And it's, it was an unusual album for me from that point of view in that it, we were doing everything in Logic. But there, mm. the practical reason for that was that Rick had got exactly the same thing at his place. So I could be working on a mix here mm. And I could literally just email him the Logic song, yes, and then he could open it up at his place, and he would hear what I'd hear the mix, mm -hmm. essentially 
the difference being that it, his was going through his Midas, right, and mine was coming through here. Okay, um, so were you using any EQ on the disc then? Or? Um, little, little touches, bits, right. little touches here so and there. Wasn't um, radically different what you were no, doing. No, I mean the the main reason, the main thing we used the desk for on on that was to just get the sound of the desk yeah. and also and the bus compressor, mm -hmm. and. Um, to be able to, you know, if we wanted to, and they were kind of stem mixes. They, they, we'd, yeah. we'd, we'd separated out uh, drum, drums and vocals generally, mm. but then other things, certain keyboards things, were, were stereo mixes. But then, if we wanted to put a little bit of uh, compression on one of the groups or one of the drums or whatever, I could um, sort of separate stuff over to here, mm -hmm. to the X rack or to to my Mutronics compressor, right? right that that sort of thing, yeah, and just do. And then we had it all set up so that all of the direct outs from the desk were going into the Pro Tools. Oh, I see. Sort right. of 1 to 24. Yeah. And uh, when it came to laying down mixes, we'd have one stereo pair, which would be the mix, yeah. and then all the rest would but be all the, the stems, essentially. Would be essentially. the stems, yeah. and we could run off the mix and the stems all in one go mm. straight into Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. So did you come back and reuse the stems at, for um, recalls? Not or? hardly. Uh, we mm -hmm. did on... Uh, we did on I think I think I remember it was one or two tracks, but we mm. did the, yeah we did do that, and the stems were also particularly useful for them for their live stuff because mm. they they use um, Ableton live, mm. but they could use those the stems that we did, mm. and and sort of reconstruct them and yeah. they they improvise a lot with Ableton mm. when they're playing live. That's the worst thing is when you you've just mixed an album or whatever they go yeah can we have all the individual. <laughs> <laughs> well, now when I do mixes, generally speaking, I, d I tend to do stems as a matter of course. Um, yeah. uh, when I'm doing a usual mix, one track at a time, once once the, all the versions are down, I'll literally just go through sort of isolating things. And I try and, I try and split the stems up as much as I can yeah. so that I'm not going to have that situation where six months down the line where mm. they go, we need that keyboard sound or whatever yeah. I've already done it yes <laughs> so <laughs> very wise <laughs> yes and although you know maybe it means that 90% of the time you've got a folder full of stems that nobody's ever going to use no but hard drives are cheap these days though. I'd rather do that than have to have the hassle of, of, of reconstructing a mix further down the line yeah. uh, although obviously that's not such a bad thing with this because of the recall and yes know, uh uh, and when I, when I'm the only thing I really have to do recall notes about these days is um, just a few little bits of outboard over here, and everything else is saved. So, mm. so the underworld songs they're they're quite long, aren't they? As well, they're all mm. seven minutes long. Do, do, does yeah. that mean you charge more per mix? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you charge by per per, per second. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. That's uh, th that would be that's a nice idea. I should mention that. So. Yes. You think Steve better be onto that? Yeah, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but there's less tracks on the record, so yeah. So who mastered that? And um, that was mastered by Miles Scholl at, M at Metropolis, right? Who I think is really, really good. Mm. Um, particularly like what he does, and you know, obviously, a lot of the time that you don't necessarily have a choice about who masters your no. stuff, but. Uh, Rick from Underworld and, and I were in close consultation all, all the way through the sort of last couple of months work on on the album so it was something we were talking about all the time right. Miles had done one of their previous albums okay and he'd also done, he'd also mastered uh, the Tracy Thorne album that I yeah. mixed and I thought did a particularly good job on mm. that so so during the mixing process were you maximizing your mixes for listening versions at all or doing any, any bus Processing along the way, or and did you end up doing any bus mixed bus processing before you sent it to Miles, or? Um, or did you no, I the, the the only sort of mixed bus processing really was the was the bus compressor on the desk. Right, and how how which, uh, savage do you have that operator? Uh, not no, <laughs> quite quite subtle. Yeah, quite subtle. Kind of what I would normally do, really, uh, a sort of fairly slow attack. And I'm just looking at it. You've got your auto release, slow auto, attack, slow attack, auto release yeah. on a like, four to one. Yeah, and then really would just have it just it. kind of tickling it. Really, I see. Yeah. Um, that's sort of what I would do on a lot of mixes. Um, more poppy stuff, I'd maybe have, um, a, you know, fast attack and mm. two to one or something mm. like that for something that needed to be a little bit more, um, a little more aggressive, yeah, compressed. Yeah. But um, 
And I, mean, were, I mean, generally speaking, with mastering, I'd, I, I'd kind of, I suppose, I'm a bit more old school from that. But would like yeah. to leave enough headroom and stuff yeah. for the mastering guy mm. to do what they do, which is, you know, they're the ones who are yeah, yeah. good at doing that. That's why, if you ever have an issue when you're sending people mixes to listen to, well, when I'm sending people listening copies, I do tend to strap a limiter across yeah. it, and when I do a bounce, mm. I'll record the mix in <coughs> just with what I've got going mm. on the desk, but then. I'll do a bounce with, uh, and I use what, the Massey L2007, L 2007, yeah. just sort of get that set up nicely and mm. sort of crank it up at 5 or 6 dB or something. Yeah, That's usually enough to keep, keep people, and, and not have the usual thing of them coming back, it's quieter than <laughs> everything else. <laughs> so shit, yes, yeah. well it's not finished, <laughs> but um, no, usually that's that's enough, to, and, and it doesn't, to me that one doesn't seem to change the sound too much. It's, mm. It sort of sounds fairly transparent, and yeah. that's, uh, unless you really crank it, of course. But, um, but interestingly, on the underworld stuff, the um, because we were working with quite a lot of dance pr production collaborators, mm. uh, they were sending us back their song files quite often with something quite severe mm. strapped on the end, oh, yeah. like a Waves Ultra Maximizer mm. or, or an Ozone or something like mm. that. And usually what we'd end up having to do with those is to sort of you know, take them off and then go, oh, crikey, <laughs> it's, re it's really doing something important. Yes. But because of the way we were mixing the other tracks, we'd sort of would maybe would have to pull that out of the equation and sort of rebuild some, some yeah. sometimes what what that was doing. Sometimes we, right. we really liked, generally we didn't think it was working necessarily right for what Underworld do, yes, because even though it's dance music, it's more dynamic than a lot, yeah, of, than a is, lot of yeah. dance. There's a lot more mm. sort of uh, builds and yeah, and and atmospheres mm. and stuff like that. So it needs more more sort of dynamic space because well, when it kicks in, it really kicks in, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, punches and yeah, you don't and want um, it squashed. But then on the other hand, there was a couple of a couple of the collaborations where what what the people particularly there was one with uh, Apple Blim. A track called Hamburg Hotel, which we ended up not re not redoing. We ended up not mixing in with this process. So oh, right. it's, it's the only one on the album that isn't done this way, right? Because his mix was so dependent on the on his mix bus processing mm. that basically when you took it off, it just sounded like something entirely different. Yeah. And, and we and we we really liked what he what yeah. the effect that it was having. Who was that? Apple Blim. Apple Blim. Yes. All right. Don't know him. But I, 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 I never got to meet him, but no. uh, uh, yeah, he's a uh, he's a young dance producer, mm. and, you know, sort of electronics, electro kind of influence thing. And and it, when we, uh, Rick spoke to him about it and said, you know, this thing about the you know the what you've got on the end, uh, his process, and it's all born out of just sort of experimentation, and uh, you know, the, has no kind of formal training as far as yeah, production sure. and yeah. engineering and mixing is concerned but he puts all this stuff on first you know yeah. puts it on bef yeah. before mixing it's sort of he mixes into the into all that stuff so um it's of course when you if you if you bypass it it just sounds like an entirely different thing so yeah. uh it, it's very much a part of the process for, yeah. for those guys i mean you'd never dream of doing that with uh, a band, no. Or something. No, mastering when engineers you... hate that, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> so we have to talk about you too, surely. Um, yeah. And did you go and collect your Grammy in person? Then did you, did you go to the awards? Well, I, I did go to the awards. Yeah. They they don't actually give you your no thing at the right. time, no, because they have to sort of um, do the you know, engraving, the plate, and yeah. all the rest of it, which they've stuck on slightly wobbly ah, on mine. So good, send it back. <laughs> yeah. I thought it took so long to get it. Took out about three months for it to come. I thought, uh, and I saw that the thing wasn't on quite straight. I was like, "Yeah, um, another Grammy, yes, yeah, whatever." <laughs> and they're all numbered and everything. Yeah. They're very. They're, they take it very seriously. It's mm. all such a. Yeah, um, I, I wasn't going to go at all, and then uh, sort of about two days before, uh, two or three days before it was going to go on, my my wife turned to me and she said, "You know, you really should go because mm. it's a you know." You know, you know you may know she didn't say you probably won't get the chance <laughs> you may never get the chance again and I thought well that's fair enough maybe I won't and and um, so I just yeah I just did it mm. and just went over and got a hotel room uh, took the opportunity to 
try and go and have a couple of meetings with a couple of A&R yeah. men while I was there and right. go to a few uh, sort of Grammy type parties mm -hmm. and fully expecting to come home empty handed because they were the, 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 the word on the street was that um, uh, what's it that Kanye West was going to win yeah. the album of the year and that was who everyone thought that was kind of seemed to have been pretty much a done deal so and of course album of the year is the very last one so mm -hmm. you've got to sit through about four hours of, yeah. of uh, the, you know country music uh, no, no. <laughs> they, 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 they don't do all of the awards at the, at no. the final thing but no. they, they was you know there was an awful lot of stuff yes, to sit through yeah. and, uh, and then we got to the end and, I, and, then, and then when they announced that this is one I was literally I did a kind of you know massive comedy double take you know kind of <laughs> 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 and then suddenly realised that I was sitting in row 25 when everybody else involved was in row two or something, so and so ran. I had to leg it, <laughs> to like crawl over a few people and then leg it up the up the aisle Brilliant. in order to be able to get onto the stage before all the bouncers appeared. Yeah. <laughs> so I did manage to get up, and I thought I got up there on the stage and uh, and sort of looked awkward for three minutes until well, Bono did a speech. <laughs> it was a very strange experience, completely mm. surreal, and but, but you know, fun, and uh, one of those things. So what was the process of, of the tracks you did? You, did you, you... They'd been produced, the tracks that we worked on were tracks that Nelly had been asked to do additional production on, right. basically, yeah. was the vibe. Uh, mm. They'd been uh, initially... I mean, U2's process is, is quite a, a long-winded yes, so thing. So yes, they have they've got two or three of their own studios mm. all kind of roughly kitted out the same one in the south of France a couple in Dublin and they regularly record when they when they're doing tracks they reg they they record as a band yeah which is great mm. but they do this while the songs are kind of in development mm. so they'll end up with quite a lot of versions of stuff mm. and you and what happened with the, the I, I did three tracks mm -hmm. and uh, two of which in, uh, are on the yeah the finished album and one's on the sort of a special edition album and um, what we ended up with being sent and then I think Chris Thomas was brought in to do some production on on the on the fin the fin so-called finished versions which actually went through more developments later right. um, and what we got to work on were basically, you know, edited versions of, mm. e of each track, and 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 we'd have things like there would be, a, say, a bass from version twenty three uh, up to this section, and then in the chorus there'd be a bass from version thirty one, and then and, and mm. so on, and they'd all been pieced together from all these different live takes of the band mm. playing, so there, it was incredibly complicated. But at the same time, it sort of was like a take of the band, but just yeah. you know edited together yeah. to be what they felt was the best version. Yeah. Uh, and then there were also an awful lot of tracks of guitars and things where they hadn't really gone, hadn't really made a lot of the choices about which bits to use. So there, right. there was quite a lot of that to sift through. So there was quite a lot of editing and sifting through and choosing and stuff, right, which right. Nelly uh, and I did together. And then we had a, a programmer, Fabian Waltman, I don't know if you know him, he was involved too. He, We were programming a few little bits of atmospheric stuff, yeah. no, nothing invasive, mm, because mm. they definitely didn't want it to sound like there was programming, Sure, obviously there, just, mm. just stuff that would enhance. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then mixing, and uh, I did one round of mixes on the tracks uh, at one point, I can't remember what time of year it was, but then they then there were some further. De they were still working on other tracks, yeah. other tracks developing, and they they'd got they got the mixes that we did at that time. And on one of the songs, they decided they wanted to change some of the parts and they wanted to change the arrangement a bit. So that happened. They sent us some new stuff, and they, things got rejigged. And then we did a, the the final yeah. round of of mixing. Um. And the mixes were fairly standard, but quite tricky because, especially with vocals, uh, Bono tends to like to record 
vocals, uh, you know, where he happens to be. Yeah. Uh, so you will get the inspiration to, to sing or you'll get an idea for lyrics. And a lot of the time he's, he's making the lyrics as he's doing the performance, mm. which is kind of keeps it really fresh. Yeah. But from a technical point of view, it's quite tricky because I'd, sometimes I'd have a bit of vocal that had been recorded in the control room on, mm -hmm. a, on a 58 through to something that had been done on in a booth. Mm. So I'd have different d different sound quality, obviously, right. on on different oh. different bits, yeah, and mm. also different degrees of spill and things yeah. like that. So yeah. what I ended up with was maybe four or five channels mm. on the desk, which are all different bits of vocal, yeah. and I would they would all have different EQs and compression mm. and mm. treatment and so on to make them all match. So yeah. that that was probably the hardest part of doing those mixes was making that work. We did. Amazing job! It's it's seamless, isn't it? I mean, you can't hear it. You can't hear the joints. We spent we spent <laughs> we spent quite a lot. I mean, the the, the 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 good thing, obviously, working with a band like that and working with a band that's got that kind of those kind of resources is mm. that the, the time was, sure. wasn't an issue. Yeah, you know, we, it was basically say you have as long as you need to get it good. So yeah, and then also once the mixes were sort of nearing completion, there was a lot of sending stuff backwards and forwards, right. and you know being as busy as they are quite often it meant going in for a day doing a few bits and bobs and then that was it for that day right. you know? so there were, it, it was fairly you know it did trundle on a little yeah. bit but that's just how it works with a band like but they're, that. I mean, they're big and warm sounding tracks aren't they it's, it's, it seems to be a lot of it's all about the bass with them yeah, well, those yeah. Were the ones I, I last night I had a quick listen back to sometimes you can't make it on your own that, that one in particular you know and, and yes. the other one that, there's just like it's bass and vocal that are just kind of there, and aren't they really? And the, the yeah, and I mean, I think I think with them the bass is. Uh, I mean, Adam's a sort of underrated mm. bass player, and he's not a sort of technically speaking. Uh, you know, uh, he, he he doesn't do anything massively complicated uh, with his playing, mm. but it's so integral mm. to what they do. I mean, and did you, I mean do. You, if you can remember that long ago, did you? I mean, did you do a lot of sort of EQing on it or compressing it, particularly the bass sound on the vocal sound? I well, obviously did a lot of processing. I think I did. Sound, uh, as far as I can remember, I did. I mean, the vocals. I say lots and lots yeah. of um, <laughs> sort of matching up yes. of sounds. But beyond that, um, uh, compression and uh, and and Bono likes his uh, vocal fairly ambient, so there's mm. quite a bit of pl a plate on there. Yeah. Um, but nothing, you know, and just the usual sort of spending quite a lot. Of, I'd, I'd got everything grouped to one fader, so yes. I, so I could do, and you know, quite often you end up doing sort of ten, fifteen passes of just tweaking automation as you go. Because this was before. I mean, although we did have everything in Pro Tools, I hadn't really, uh, quite at that stage, quite got to the point where I was doing a lot of drawing of no. of. Of auto I'd so this was automating on an SSL. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it was on a uh, Nelly's uh, big SSL in mm. his place. Uh, uh, it's an E series with, right. with a G computer. Yeah, G so computer, good old the kind of standard yeah. thing with VCAs. Yeah. No, no, no moving faders Great. and stuff. It was just proper old school. Yeah, really old school and 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 outboard everywhere. Yeah, lots of eleven seventy sixes were sort of used on. A, almost not everything, but a, yes. a lot of things. Right, right. Um, they had to be black ones. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> because I, who I said mean, that? Was that was that the, uh, no, the band's demand? No, actually not. No, no. I see. I wasn't. It, it was one of those things because it went through several hands and because it went through several stages. There, I wasn't the only person who, who was did mixing on it. Um, uh, Nelly at one point was using his the, the engineer he uses in America particularly on Gwen Stefani stuff, Greg Collins, he did some a bit of mixing on it as well. And he introduced the sort of blackface 1176 on the snare part of the mix. And so, yeah, there was an element of it being a collaborative process, which yeah. is very new school, really. Mm -hmm. It's that, that you know, before it, it old school thing would be, there'd be one producer mm -hmm. and one guy mixing it and, that, and one guy recording it and that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. This was this was very much more, you know, whatever works and mm. whoever's available at that particular moment in yeah. time, sort of yeah. thing. And because it was the, uh, the the album had been stretching out over a couple of years, they, they that was almost inevitable. Yeah. Not everybody's just going to be sitting around going right. Let's uh, move the snare slightly. <laughs> <laughs> we have to get somebody else, some other 
very experienced engineer to come in and go, I'll move this now slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so there was an element of it being very precise, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, the overall vibe of it was to keep it as natural yeah. and, and, and just, you know, it takes a lot of work to make something sound like it was done in five minutes, I think was the, <laughs> was the whole kind of vibe of it, yeah. really. <laughs> and the whole bass thing, yes. No, the bass, um, I mean, my standard thing with the bass is, is to uh, compress a fair bit, mm. unless uh, uh, I've been specifically asked not to, like, uh, like with Robbie Shakespeare, for example. All right. It really it was very clear that he never wanted his bass compressed. Wow. <laughs> I suppose somebody of that calibre. Yes, you have it exactly how you, you play, nice and evenly. With, with, <laughs> yeah, no, he 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 plays uh, round round strings, yeah. so they sound they don't, they have no top no. at all. Yeah. It's just all, and he plays it completely even, so it's perfect. Just, yeah. don't need compression at Amazing. all. Amazing. Whereas uh, you know, U 2s bass playing uh, was very much more fitted with the standard thing of. Um, Sort of slow attack and mm. sort of about six to one and compressing uh, about five six dB or something on the loudest notes. What would you use to do that? Would that be a dBx or? A um, I think um, uh, if it was at Nelly's, it would have probably been um, a dBx one sixty. Mm. The old, old one sixty, yeah, the meter one, yeah. yeah. I'm also I'm also sort of seriously starting to think in terms of whether or not I should start my own little label as well, mm. which I'm thinking of doing. I'm taking it more seriously the more I think about it. All right. Because uh, is there money to be made having a record label these days? Um, to a degree, to a degree, yes. I think it depends what sort of deals you have, obviously, mm. with with your artists and um, and and whether you're involved in, obviously the. The production and writing and things as well, which is uh, which I intend to be. Mm. It's going to be a very small scale thing. I mean, do you do much writing then? Is that something um, you... yeah, bits and bobs? Yeah. yeah, bits and bobs. And and in the same respect that sometimes you get additional production needed on something where some some sometimes things need a little bit of help in the writing department. I'm, yeah. I'm quite keen to do a bit of that mm. from time to time. And uh, yeah, if I hadn't been so busy for the last. 20 years I'm sure I would have probably done more <laughs> writing but I, I just haven't yeah. had the opportunity yeah. Really. Yeah. I do have try and make sure I've got a guitar or something nearby so I can I can try and work on a few little ideas um, and yeah more of that to come really mm. uh, as I say I've been producing more things over the last few years and, and, and one of the main reasons for getting this place wasn't just so I had my own mixing room, it was also so I, I could, if I wanted to write something, I could do it in here and I could, yeah. I could do a good version of it rather mm. than just it being an idea. Mm. So I think having the flexibility mm. and also having, having, the, having the place next door, having the uh, high band with the, the venue, there's gigs going on there two or three times a week, right. they, they have a studio over there, I can... I can hire out their space to record in. Yeah, that sort of thing. It's it, there's a little scene going on around yeah. here, which is which is healthy, and uh, I, and I'm constantly meeting new new musicians passing through this way. So yeah, there, there's there's a, there's a lot going on. Yeah, right. Watch this space. Yes, indeed, and also sort of starting to look into the possibility of of maybe getting representation in America and that sort of thing. Does Steve Budd not do that then? Or? Uh, well, no, if, if he can, if, yeah. he, if he can get me work from America, then he then right. He, then but you think of looking up with an American? He does. But it, uh, yeah, just it might be good to have somebody over there keeping and uh, you know put, looking out for things as well, because mm. you know obviously the American market uh, is bigger. Yeah. And I mean, would that be with a view to you going out there or? Projects coming here, uh, preferably for them to send them over here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't. Mind. Obviously, it's quite nice going and working over there occasionally, and yeah. I've, I've done it a couple of times, and, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I'm, yeah. like I've been and done things in France and Denmark and Poland. And, yeah, we all go and do these yeah, things yeah. from time yeah. to time, yeah. and it's always fun. But you know, I'm a family man these days. And I've got this place to run, yeah. So um, I don't really want to be going off for months at a time, sure, uh, uh, and leaving all of that behind. So yeah, and, and and these days it's so much easier. I mean, you yeah. you know, somebody can literally just send you a zip file, yeah, 
with their track in it, mm. you can mix it and send it back to them later that day. And uh, and they can, and with Skype, you can mm. literally have them there on your screen having a conversation with them about details of a mix while you're doing it. And yeah. It's it's so it's easy to do it now like that. Yeah. I mean, in some ways it's a shame. It's not always nice to have a person sitting yeah. on the sofa <laughs> saying, "Turn that up." Or yeah, but it makes it easier for you to manage your time, doesn't it? So I don't know if you, yeah, you find you know because then you can kind of do the mix when you want to do it. Well, exactly. That that was also another big. There, there were you know a whole list of reasons why it's a good idea to have your own studio. And is this of, close to home? Or do you live quite near? I live about fifteen minutes driveway. Yeah. yeah, so it's very convenient. Mm. And uh, and you know, like I say, I take the kids to school. Right. In the morning, and then come here. So I'm in here nice and early. Yeah. I can work sort of more like sensible hours. Hmm. Um, obviously, occasionally I work through the night if it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. But if it's not, then I'll finish off at a sensible time and have a have a life outside of the studio, and then come back the next day and finish something off. Yeah. I have the luxury of doing that now, yeah. instead of you know. Obviously, if you go into a, an expensive studio and you you, you it has to be finished that mm-hmm. day, mm-hmm. you carry on until it's finished. Yeah whether you want to or not <laughs> but now it's great because you know, you know mixing is just like writing or or playing or you know you're not necessarily on any given day going to be in the right frame of mind to get something perfect mm. and i think the results that i can get doing working this way are going to be are well they've proved to be better in in some respects yeah they maybe take a little bit longer but yeah. that's not really an issue and I, I think coming back and and getting on something fresh uh, that you've been working on the day before is mm. is, is really positive. Yeah. I mean, it took a little while, took me. Yeah. It took a few months to really settle yeah. in and get used to it. Uh, like anywhere, it's very one of the difficult things about being asked to go and work in other studios. I'm sure you're yeah. fully aware of that. Is that when you when you especially if you you're abroad and you're in a completely different environment as well and you go into a studio and you t- sort of listen to the monitors for the first time and they they're going right well, let's start the first mix and you're going oh, I don't even know what this room sounds like it's all oh, the monitors or whatever it's uh, you know and then maybe by the time you finish mixing the album you're just starting to get used to <laughs> what what it's like so yeah there's a massive advantage to being in your own space yeah yeah absolutely Brilliant. I think we better stop before I Run out of disk space and have to spend the rest of my life typing. Don't worry, I can keep talking. I can, all clearly, day. I'd love to chat with you all day. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, there are so many things I haven't got around to asking you, but uh, otherwise, I'm never going to finish writing the article. <laughs> well, anyway, and, I mean, do feel free if you want to. <laughs> if you want to ask a few quickies, I mean, I'll, I'll try and do some quick answers if you want. <laughs> I, mean, I, have, I have been. Uh, no, I think we've. Covered have you been so videoing? Much. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I think we've got it all covered. I can't assignment. believe we're videoing the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were just sort of having it take random photos or something. <laughs> no, 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 I haven't taken any Highly disguised. Yet. That's the problem. So oh, have you got stills to do as well? I have. Oh, yeah. you, you, can, you can snip stills out of that, I assume. Not, 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 not the not same quality, not good enough quality. 